Many of you were not even born in 1978 when we began this church. That was a, quite an event in the history of the Philippines because we started the church at Club Filipino. And uh, Dave Yant was given a membership there. And so we rented one of the rooms at a discount to have our weekly services. But we ran out of money <laughs> in about uh, three months, so we had to move to a sound studio. And then we moved to Metacore, one office, and then the next office, and then the next office, and then the office across the hall, until we took the three floors, and then God moved us to this building. Praise God for what he's done. We started with 35 people. Now look at what the Lord has done. Praise the Lord. Christmas is a special time for me. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a season of the year that I've had great events happen in my life. I was converted later in life, 21 years of age. I was an alcoholic. I was a thief. My profession was burglarizing homes. And a young man shared the gospel with me. Uh, after that year of discipleship, I went to a Bible school in Canada. And I'll always remember the, the Christmas program. They had a huge 200 voice choir at the Bible school, a hundred piece orchestra, 4,000 people in attendance. And I was there taking in this first Christmas since I had become a Christian. And I was in awe, like many of you are almost every year. This is how you celebrate the birth of the Savior. And the choir was singing, O Holy Night. And as they were singing, a girl walked up, young lady, walked up to the microphone to sing the solo part. Now, I'm up in the balcony, like this, way in the back row, and I was ushering that night. And as this girl began to sing, I actually looked twice, because I thought an angel had come down from heaven. And as she sang, I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, I don't deserve a wife. Because of the past life that I've lived, I don't deserve one. But if you do give me one, I want that one right there. <laughs> and God led us together that next summer. Now, I went to India after finishing Bible school for two years and came back. And Margaret and I were married on De December. December 27. Two days after Christmas. So I love Christmas. In fact, I'm having a party, an anniversary party. Would all of you like to come? <laughs> it's, let's look in the Word of God this morning, and I'd like to deal, deal with the passage of Scripture, uh, the Christmas story, uh, but in a little bit different way. And just look at the price that Christmas cost. Six different individuals and groups of people. Since we are called to celebrate a Christian Christmas, we need to remind ourselves as an, of an important truth, namely, that there was a price to be paid by all those connected with the Christmas event. So let's notice the price paid by, number one, Mary, and secondly, by Joseph, the price paid by the shepherds, by the wise men. The price, the sacrifice paid by God the Father in sending his son. And lastly, the price paid by the Lord Jesus. So let's look at these six events in the lives of these people and observe the sacrifice paid for the glory of God at Christmas. Number one, the price paid by Mary. The shame Mary endured. Luke 1, 26 and 27 and 28 says, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. Now it really wasn't much of a city. Uh, it, was a, it, was in a, it was in a Gentile section of the province. Uh, there were not, wasn't a Jewish community. They were living in a Jewish community, but it was mainly a Gentile city. 
account. Gabriel went to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. Verse 34, Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? He announced what was going to happen. He explained the the incarnation, and yet, as anyone would ask, how can this be? Luke one thirty seven, for nothing will be impossible with God. Now, it's not the same with us, but similar. Many times, God will ask you to do something, trust him for something. And you say, well, how can this possibly be? You know, I, I'm just a... I'm just a young person, or I'm too old, or I have no money, I don't have the intellect, or I don't have the position. And many times, no matter what our situation in life, we always hesitate and even question God, how can this be? You don't know who you're talking to. I am just, as Mary said, I am just a virgin. Verse 38, and Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord may it be done to me according to your word. Do you notice that? See, that's the key. She said, I don't understand. I, I don't know what the steps I will take for you to accomplish this in my life. I, I'm just a young girl. I don't even have any connections. You, you, you're calling me to bring in the Messiah? Long awaited for <laughs> Son of God. But instead of saying, why me? Mary said, why not me? God has promised the Messiah through a virgin. So why not me? Lord, I am willing. May it be done to me according to your word. This was a cost of Christmas. Secondly, look at Joseph, the price paid by Joseph, the stigma that Joseph carried. Matthew 1, 24 and 25. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife and but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. Look at this simple Godly man in an obscure Galilean village. But recognizing the fact that he was chosen by a sovereign God to be adopted father of God in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ. The birthright to the throne of David came through Mary. But royalty to the throne of David came through Joseph. Joseph, possibly simply desiring a simple life in a small town of Nazareth with a wife and children, but caring for a family, but with Mary, begin to suffer the stigma and the shame and the slander and the embarrassment and the gossip and the ridicule and the total loss of reputation. In commandment, following the commandment of Jesus. Do you hear what I just said? Not just embarrassment. The total loss of reputation. Here they were. Here they were Jews in 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 a heathen community. And they were supposed to be examples. And followers of the Lord God Jehovah. And and yet yet they lost their reputation. Are you and I willing to step down in situations that even our reputation is lost because of following the commands of the Lord Jesus Christ? Number three, the price paid by the shepherds. Their lives were dramatically interrupted. Three things. Number one, they saw the light. Luke 2, 8 to 14 says, In the same region there were some shepherds 
staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. Notice that all people. Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, pagans, sinners like you and me. For all people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths, swaddling clothes, and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Shepherding was a despised uh, profession. Shepherds usually worked seven days a week. They were considered dishonest, unreliable, and thieves. They didn't have the rights of a citizen and could not testify in court. They were considered just above the status of the outcast of a leper. And yet it was to to this group, to this group of lowly, dirty, smelly, despised shepherds that the heavenly announcement of the most glorious event in all of history came. Jesus is born in the city of David. And secondly, they found him, Christ the Messiah. Luke two fifteen to 16, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, let us go straight to Bethlehem. And see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. They believed in him and declared the good news. Thirdly, Luke 2, 17. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. Luke 2, 20, the shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen just as had been told them. They made known to the glorious good news of the Savior, which is Christ the Lord, a Savior for all people. Many of us have had this glorious message declared to us by our parents, a, a barrio pastor, uh, a college mate, a college professor, a taxi driver, or maybe even a janitor. There was an OFW in, hired by the Vatican in Rome. Uh, he was hired to, to clean the CRs, the restrooms, and to mop the floors. And I can just see him as he was mopping the floor one day. He heard two priests, prestigious priests, studying for their doctorate degree in Rome and he heard them talking in Italian, the Italian language. But as he walked, as he was mopping and he walked by them, he detected an, the accent, the accent of one of the priests, even though he's speaking Italian. So when they finished talking, he said, excuse me, sir, are you Filipino? And the priest said, well, yes, I am. So he began to talk to him in Tagalog. What do you think they talked about? This janitor, only a janitor, only a CR scrubber, a floor scrubber, uh, basically uh, less than a common tao. He takes this opportunity, sir, have you heard the gospel? What's that? And he shares the gospel of Jesus Christ with this priest. And the priest heard the gospel and over several days turned from sin to the Savior, and became a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, that's what, you, that's what the shepherds did. That's what you and I to do, are to do. For the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. See, so often we think the power is in us, the way we share it. Now, we need to share it well. If I'm going, if, I, if I'm invited to Mullican Young today, 
this afternoon between the services. Hey, Mr. Nichols, would you come down and have a cup of coffee with me, merienda? I have some good ensamada, and we'll have a nice little, little meeting together. Well, if I go down to Mullican Young, I'm not going to wear my shorts and chanelas and wear a T-shirt that says I'm from Texas. <laughs> you know, I'm going to wear a brown Tagalog. I'll wear a suit. I'll comb my hair. I'll put on some cologne. I'll brush my teeth, put a breath mitt, shine my shoes. That's not the gospel, but it's a way to get in. I don't want to cause embarrassment. And, and, and shame to the person I'm visiting. If I work with teenagers, if you work with teenagers, you seek to dress more like them. If, you work with, uh, if I work with street kids on the street, I don't wear a suit and a tie. But see, all those, those are methods. But the methods are to enhance the power of the God. The gospel is the power of God to salvation. So you may feel not here in witnessing to certain people. But notice when you say, I'm shy, I'm not here, where's the focus? The focus is on you. And our focus should be on the person that we want to see come to an understanding of the gospel. We need to do it well. But do it! Because the gospel is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes. So what is the gospel? What is the gospel we're to share? The gospel is very simply Jesus Christ. He is the Son of God, the Son of Man, sent into this world to be born of a virgin that he might be sinless, that he might be born under the law, to keep the very law that you and I break day after day after day. The perfect, sinless Son of God has met all the requirements of the law and is ready to give his righteousness to us that we would have a perfect standing before God. The gospel is that he went to the cross. There upon that cross, the sins of everyone that that believe in him were transferred to him, to him who knew no sin. God made to be the sin for us, that we might become righteousness of God because of the Lord Jesus Christ. The great exchange of the cross, the worst about me, was placed upon him. The best about him was placed upon me. As he shed his blood upon that cross, he reconciled sinful men to holy God. It was as if he took sinful man in one hand and holy God in the other and brought the two together through the death on the cross. By that death, Christ satisfied the righteous anger of God and appeased his wrath toward all who would believe in him. It was by that death that Jesus Christ has provided salvation free for all who would call upon his name. Just before he died, he said, it is finished. He did not say, I am finished. It is finished. All that had needed to be done for your and our, my salvation was completed on the cross in his burial, in his resurrection, in his life today. The Lord Jesus says, Him who comes unto me, I will in no wise cast out. He loves to save sinners. He is a friend of sinners. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. He came to save sinners just like you, just like you and just like me. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I am the way. Without the way, there is no going. I am the truth. Without the truth, there is no knowing. I am the life. Without the life, there is no living. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself on the cross as a ransom for a man. So what, is, what more is there to say? Listen, everybody. The gates of paradise are open. They're open to all who would come to Jesus by grace through faith. The door is open. That's the gospel. That's, this is the cost, the price of Christmas. Yes, number one, the price paid by Mary. The price paid by Joseph. 
the price paid by the shepherds. Now number four, the price paid by the wise men. They gave of their time and their treasure. Matthew 2, 10 to 11. When they, the wise men, saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming to the house, this was two years after Jesus was born. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. And they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now notice the giving of the t- their time. These kings of the east traveled for up to two years to find the king of the Jews, the Messiah. We always have time for what is important to us. Don't we? Even simple things. We make time for those things that we like or that we enjoy. Something very simple happened to me last week. I was had a very busy schedule and and I arranged my time that I could be near a tropical hut at noon. Because tropical hut has my favorite hamburger. The classic. I remember when I went in, the, the, the lady behind the counter recognized me from two years ago. As I came in, she just pointed at me and said, oh, the classic. <laughs> and so I ordered my classic and got some water and some hot sauce. And I went over in the corner and I was reading and studying while they were making my hamburger. They brought it to me and I opened it up. And I remember looking at it for a minute and I put the hot sauce on. And I took my first bite and I thought I died and went to heaven. <laughs> it was so good I forgot my name. And, you know, we, we do that, don't we? But we as Christians have found the Messiah, haven't we? We found, and, and because of we're his followers, though, how do we spend our time? See, the wise men, they were looking for the Messiah. We have found him. Most of us here have have trusted him as Savior. We're followers of the Lord God Almighty. We're followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, here in the Philippines, they even call us, what? Manampalataya, true believers. But now that we have found the Messiah, how do we use our time? How do we use our time in worship, in the Word of God, in work, in witness? What about worship? How do we worship the Lord? You know, we had an ordinance today. We come to church. Never miss church. If you're sick, that's one thing. My wife is sick today. She's home and she's at our guest house and she's in bed. I hope to bring her here tonight for the evening service. But never miss church. You know, it's a place that the Hebrew says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as a manner of some is. If you're discouraged, if you're disheartened, don't stay away from church. Come. That you can be encouraged in the things of God. That you can participate in baptism, the Lord's Supper, communion, singing hymns and songs, spiritual songs. That you might be built up in the faith. That you may be challenged. That you might be convicted. But you need to worship. Worship. Spend time every week in worship. But also the Word of God. How do you spend your time in the Word of God? Peter says, grow in grace and knowledge of Christ. As you spend time in the, Lord, in the Word, you grow. And maybe that's some, one of the reasons why some of you are not growing. You know, it's embarrassing to be around some people. You've known them for 20, 30 years, and they're just like they were 20, 30 years ago. You know, I would think that if you're with someone for 20, 30, 40 50 years, you become more like that person. But instead of us becoming more like Jesus, by spending time in the Word and worship, we become like somebody else, the enemy. As you spend growing grace, you're to grow up in the faith. All of us, that's why we're together as a body of Christ, to challenge, to encourage, to stimulate one another to love and good works. Always have a copy of the Bible and New Testament with you. 
Now, I know we're living in a digital age. I know we have the cell phones, and most of you have the iPhone, and you have everything on the iPhone. You know, you got iPhones, it brushes your teeth for you, it makes your coffee for you, and all that. And you have the Bible on the iPhone. I would, I would encourage you to always carry a copy of the New Testament or a Bible with you. And when you have a few moments, don't just automatically bring out your cell phone and go start going through it. Seeing who wrote you about, oh, I'm shopping today. What are you doing? Oh, I found this goodbye. Oh, I'm stuck in traffic. Oh, big deal. You know, we, we on the Facebook and all that gobbledygook. You know, spend time in the Word of God. Open the New Testament. I was on a plane the other day. It's really interesting. I'm not a witness. I'm not an evangelist. I seek to be a witness, but I'm not an evangelist. And I, I decided that day... I was going to read all the way through Romans. I was a very busy day, traveling and speaking and doing. I was going to read all the way through the book of Romans, all 16 chapters. And I'm a slow reader. I didn't learn to read until I was 22. So I had my little red New Testament, and I was upgraded to business class. Wow, have you ever read business class? Wow, they bring you orange juice and, you know, ensamata, you know, classic hamburgers. And and I'm sitting there, and I'm reading my New Testament. And the flight attendant walks over and she says, she, I'm right here reading, and she's right here, she lives way over, puts her head, oh, that is a good book. We're studying Romans in our Bible study. And then she, oh, she takes off and she's waiting on everybody. And the man next to me says, I don't believe that stuff. I don't believe that stuff. And I just turned to him and I said, well, that's your problem. As I said, I'm not an evangelist. <laughs> uh, that's your problem. I said, why don't you believe it? He said, well, I'm a pastor. I've been pastoring for 30 years. I said, well, what kind of a pastor are you? I found it was a liberal church. Did not believe in the inspiration of the Word of God. And so I, well, I, did, I just began to share the gospel with him. He said, well, I don't know. Does the Bible make any difference? I said, let me ask you a question. I said, here I am sitting here. I don't know that flight attendant, and I don't know you. But if I wanted to be like somebody, who would I want to be like? Here you're sitting here. you got a Rolex watch. you got a, you got a shirt open down to your belly button. Your hair is all sticking out. you got a gold chain. you got these rich shoes. you got a leather jacket. And I, but you're miserable. You know, look in the mirror. And I said, who would I want to be like? Would I want to be like you? Or would I want to be like her? I said, she has found the truth of the word. Look how she's taking care of people. Look at her smile. Look at her radiance. Look at She's not even beautiful. But there's something radiant. (laughs) There's something radiant about her. It's the way she ministered to people. Who would I want to be like? And he said, well, you do have a point. Now, what caused that? That lady was growing in the word of God. Have a motto. I have a motto, no Bible, no breakfast. No Bible, no breakfast. Now, you may not be able to have that. I'll get up early in the morning, and I'm up at 5 o'clock. I'm old. I can't sleep. Don't get old. It'll kill you. I get up at 5 o'clock, and my wife and I walk, do our mile walk, and I clean up and get a cup of good, strong Batangas coffee and a Pondesol, and and then I, I sit, and I have my... Bible study. And no matter what, whether it's only 15 minutes or 30 minutes or an hour, no Bible, no breakfast. Now, you may not be able to do it quite like that, but make it an emphasis in your life, an important emphasis, that you spend time in the Word of God to read it, to study it, to memorize it, to meditate in it, that you might grow in grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And the third way to use our time is our work. Don't just go to work to put in time. Go to work to make a difference for the glory of God. Whether you're a, whether you're a student, a businessman, in the military, a policeman, a tricycle driver, whatever you do, whatever your work is, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Another verse, whatever your hand finds to do, do it to the glory of God. Make a difference. 
You're the, going to be the best manager in the city of Manila for the glory of God. You're going to be the best CR cleaner in Manila to the glory of God. But your work. Now worship the word of God, work, but also use our witness. Use our time to witness. Not all of us are evangelists, but all of us are to be a witness. Jesus said, and you shall be witnesses of me. Not of you, but of me. All of us to, to live out something in our lives that will cause people to be drawn to the Savior. And use whatever, whatever the opportunity is. God gave me cancer that I might share the gospel with people in hospitals. My wife had to rush me down. I was going, I had my cancer surgery and I was going through chemotherapy and radiation and I was sick. My mouth was burned to a crisp and I was painful all over my body and I had a blockage inside and they had to take me to an emergency and they took me in this room and this, this smelly nurse, male nurse, big guy, I don't think he'd taken a bath in a week. <laughs> and he was moving me on the table and, and giving his x-rays and stuff and, and it was very painful. Every time he moved me, I was in such pain. And uh, I probably, I, I said, oh, oh, ah. And I looked at him, and he was crying. And I said, sir, what's wrong? He said, I'm so sorry to hurt you so much. It must be so painful. And there I was in my pain, and I didn't know what to say. I said, sir, can I ask you to do me a favor? He said, what? I said, would you just push me off on the floor and let me die? Because this is so miserable that I, I would just like to die and go to heaven. He said, oh, are you going to heaven? I said, yeah, I'm going to heaven. Are you going to heaven? He said, no, I'm not going to heaven. I said, would you like to go to heaven? There I'm lying on the floor. <laughs> you know, it's, it's on the, on the, the, telling this man about Jesus in the pain, in the agony. See, that's what a witness is. I didn't plan that. I wouldn't want you to have cancer or sickness or difficulty. But if you do, whatever the situation is, seek to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. I have to tell you this. I was at Cinnabon. I shouldn't tell people what I like to eat. Cinnabon over at Podium. Have you ever been there? It cost you about 485 pesos to walk in the door. <laughs> I walked in, I was with a friend, and he wanted to have one of those Cinnabons and a cup of coffee. I said, well, I don't need a Cinnabon, but I'll have a cup of coffee. So we're sitting there, and he goes up, and he, he buys a Cinnabon for me and one for him. But they had a special that day. He misread the menu. So instead of getting one Cinnabon for me and one for him, he got a dozen for me and a dozen for him. <laughs> oh, I said, hey, brother, I don't know what we're going to do, but we've got to get rid of these... These cinnamons, because our, our wives are coming soon. And if they see us, we're in trouble. No Christmas present for us. And so over in the corner, there was a, an official man, beautiful, born to Tagalog, and, and he had all these men in black uniforms all around with their machine guns outside and four inside, and they were all staying there. And he was talking to two other men, and they had suits. I thought, oh, they might like our cinnamons. So I picked up these cinnamons and walked over. When I walked over, man, everybody started to draw. <laughs> well, oh, I'm not, these, are, these may be dangerous, but they're not bullets, you know. And I, said, and I walked over to the man. He stood up. And I said, sir, our wives are coming in a few minutes. So we're going to get in trouble. I haven't all seen them. Would you like to share them with your men here, with your guards? And he said, oh. Oh, yes. Well, thank you. So I went back and sat down. About 30 minutes later, they were getting up to leave. So instead of going out the door, here he comes over to our table with all of his men. I thought, I'm in trouble. What was in those cinnamons? He came over, and I stood up, and he said, Excuse me, but may I say something? He said, People are not usually nice to me. People are not usually nice to me. Thank you for your kindness. Now, isn't that something? And then I said, well, sir. He said, who are you? So I introduced myself and began to share the grace of God through the gospel. 
invite him to church. You know, it's really interesting. Why don't you do the same? In fact, some of us could get this together. We could start a new ministry. Donut evangelism. But it's these ways, to seek to be a witness. You know, seek to build into your life some kind of a, a, a fragrance, not physical smell. But as Jesus speaks of it, speaks about that Jesus being the fragrance, fragrance of Christ. You know, when we go to a place, is there a, a lasting presence that Jesus has been there because we were there? Colossians says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ goes in us to wherever we go. Do people see that there's a difference? By the way we dress, our modesty, our kindness to people. Being friendly, helping people with their, giving somebody the seat. Letting people go first. Serving people, being gracious to guards. Being kind to our Cthulongs. You know, looking for ways that we, we don't kick a street kid. We, 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 we say hello and Merry Christmas and how are you and giving him something to eat. All these things open the door for us to share the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. The wise men gave of their time. They also gave of their treasure. God does not need our treasures. But we need to give that which is important to us to prove that Christ is more important to us than things. Our treasures. In worship, the Magi gave gold, frankincense, and myrrh to the Lord Jesus. Now the Bible gives no indication to the exact significance of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But some have made suggestions. For example, gold is for royalty. Jesus was king, as the wise men knew and acknowledged. He was the king of kings. One of my favorite preachers in the past was a man by the name of a black pastor, African-American pastor in San Diego, California. His name was Shadrach Meshach Lockridge. And he has a sermon. You can go on YouTube and watch the sermon. And at the first part of the sermon, he talks about the king of kings. He says, my king, my king, Jesus, is a seven-way king. He's the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. My king is king of kings. And that's what gold stood for, royalty. But then there's frankincense, which some say stands for deity. The incense was used in worship in the temple. Now this points to Christ as our great high priest. Frankincense spoke of the perfection and holiness of Christ. The holiness of Christ. You know, in our freedom as evangelicals in our worship with God, of God, let's be very careful that we do not become too familiar and flamboyant and, and, and tacky about the way we worship. Come to worship in seriousness. Be, be careful that you, when you enter God's presence, you honor Him. You know, when you go to, you know, that might even be the way you dress when you come to church. You know, you don't need to dress in a suit and bar on the galog and polo bar and so forth, but you need to be neat. And I have a question for you men. Why do all the women look nice and many of you men look like you're going on a picnic? You're going to the beach. You know, you know let's be a little, a little bit more careful. You know, so that we can immediately enter into a situation that we're not causing embarrassment. Uh, that we might recognize, no, clothes do not make you holy. But many times the way we dress shows what's inside. Are we, are we tacky? Are we sloppy? I mean, let's not be sloppy in the way we worship the Savior. And myrrh points to the suffering and death of Christ. Myrrh was used in embalming and it was also used as a pain reliever. On the cross, Christ refused wine mixed with myrrh to deaden the pain as he desired to suffer the full extent of death for us on the cross. Someone wrote, Go for a king, frankincense for a priest, myrrh for one that was to die. These were the gifts of the wise men. 
and even at the cradle of Jesus, they foretold that he was to be the true king, the perfect high priest, and the savior of the world. The wise men gave their time and treasures to worship the Messiah. This was a cost of Christmas. Number five, the price paid by God the Father. God provided the price for sin. Firstly, first, God loves gives. God loves gives. John 3, 16, 17, and 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Notice that, so. So, he didn't say God loved the world. He said God so loved the world. He loved it so much. He gave his best. When I left my wife this morning, I said, Margaret, I love you so much. You know, it's the emphasis there on the soul. I love you. What would ever happen to me if something happened to you? What would I do? God so loves the world that he, lived, that he gave his son. And remember, if you doubt God's love, remember the soul. He so loved the world that he gave his best for you. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Now, be careful here. God did not come to judge, but the Bible says he will be the judge. But you see, the emphasis of here, he loved you so much, he didn't come to judge. His first priority was he died on the cross for you. His love was to be manifested to you by giving his son, the Lord Jesus, for you. He didn't come to judge you, he came to save you. However, he will judge. We need to pray for justice. Yesterday morning, I had a, I had a, I had a hard time I'm going through the Psalms. And I see how David prayed that God would judge the wicked. And I begin to pray that God would judge these corrupt officials who are stealing much of the relief items that are coming to the Philippines for the poor. I begin to pray that God would judge those people who are selling these 15,000 child prostitutes in Manila between the ages of 9 and 12. God, would you judge them? God, where's the justice? People have sacrificed to give and yet it's to help the poor and yet it's stolen. So depression of the poor. God, would you judge them? Please bring justice. But then I remembered something. That's God's job. God does the judging. God does the, brings justice. He does that. We pray for him to do that. But we don't do that. What do we do? We bring the message of salvation. See, that corrupt official is never going to change until he comes to faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So when you get to these officials, don't look for joys to get on their good side. Make sure that they can somehow hear a message that they can get on the good side of Jesus. But you and I need to share the gospel with these people. Pray they'll come to faith in Christ. No, they're wicked. They're wicked. But they're sinners. God came to save sinners and bring them to repentance. God's love is great. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love. See, God so loved the world that he gave. Here, being rich in mercy because of his great love, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with grace with Christ, by grace, you have been saved. The enemies of Christ could not have taken him, could not have put Jesus on the cross if God had not first given him. As wicked as the world was and as it is today, Christ could not have been hung on the cross by the power and wickedness of humanity if God had not given him. God's love gives. That was the price of Christmas. And my last point, number six. The price paid by the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. His self-abasement, his humility. Philippians 2, 5 to 7. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, 
who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant. See, there's that same word that Mary used, the handmaiden of the Lord, the, the bondservant. Jesus uses the same word, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Now notice the price paid for Christ in his birth, in his life, and in his death. In his birth, he was born in a barn, laid in a manger, a feeding trough, surrounded, simply surrounded by poor shepherds, despised shepherds. The message of Christmas is not the proclamation of a holiday or the declaration of a season. It is about the proclamation of a person and declaration of salvation. The birth of this child in the manger, which was a feeding trough, some say just carved out in, in stone, born in a manger was an event that prophets had written about. The people of Israel had spoken about. The patriarchs of old had writ, wondered about. And the angels of God shouted about when they announced the birth of this little child, this little child in his humility, born in a barn, that you and I might receive the gift of salvation. Notice the price paid in his, in his life. He went from place to place, driven out by the religious and political leaders, despised by many, not everyone accepting his message. He said, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. That was the description that he gave of himself. The Son of Man, Jesus, the Son of God, had no place to lay his head. On Friday, I was visiting a, a little campsite outside of Manila in the mountains on Marcus Highway. And uh, 33 street kids arrived at the camp in and, and one jeep, one jeepney, 33 people, little kids. They were so excited. And they were running around. And it's a rustic place. <clears throat> Doesn't have nice accommodations. Doesn't have running water. They have to bring it from the stream with a bucket. But they have a little play area. And they have a kind of a barbecue pit out there. And the kids are running around. These are street kids. They're out in the country. And I was, I was, I was concerned because I found out they were going to all sleep in this one room. And they were, this is a nice room. Nice fresh air. But they were sleeping on mats. Little mats and a little pillow, and they were so excited because they didn't have to sleep out under the overpass. They could uh, fly over. They could sleep not in an alley. They didn't have to worry about being raped. And so they could sleep on a little mat in this room. And, and it concerned me, <laughs> that little mat. But then I remembered that was much better than Jesus had. <clears throat> they had a place to lay their head. They had people to care for them and feed them and clothe them. But Jesus had no place to lay his head. Yes, the price paid in his birth, in his, li in his life, but especially in his death. Philippians 2, 8 to 11, being found in appearance as a man, <clears throat> Christ humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Beaten, stripped naked before the world, dying as a criminal, with the sins of the world heaped upon him, but he did it for you and he did it for me. There never was another like Jesus. There never was another who was God but became man. There never was another who was a human child but also a divine son who was wounded by Satan and who at the same time crushed Satan, who was appointed the Savior of men, yet was crucified by men, who was judge of men, yet was led out to suffer and die as a criminal by men. There was never another <clears throat> who died and was buried and yet lived, who saved others and himself could not save, who had no sin in him, yet the sins of the world were on him, who was the king of glory, yet wore no crown, but a crown of thorns. There was never another who was the prince of life, yet died on Calvary. There never was another who created all seas and all lakes and all rivers, unless one, some of the last words he said on the cross was, I thirst. 
There never was another like Jesus. That was the price of Christmas. That was the price of Christmas. <clears throat> Let me close. <clears throat> As Christ is the reason for the season, let's be careful that we keep him the center of the season. The reason of the season, yes, we rec- but are we keeping him as the center of the season? My wife, Margaret, her father, Walter Jesperson, served in China, in Sichuan province for many years. Uh, he, this last March, he had his 100th birthday, and we really celebrated. He died in July. He died in July. But we had a great celebration. We go to a Chinese church and in Seattle, and, and boy, the Chinese and Filipinos know how to celebrate a birthday, for especially for elderly. Well, when Dad, 10 years ago, was 90, we had a birthday party for him. We went to a, a church that had a, a large uh, <clears throat> fellowship hall. We invited a lot of people, about 150 people came. So here they came, and oh, they were so glad to see Dad, and balloons, and presents, and people bought his favorite lemon meringue pie. I think we had about 20 lemon meringue pies, and his favorite pie, and they love him so much, and they came to honor him. I got Dad a plate of food, and I took him over to the main table, and set him down at the table, and I said to the people around the table, my nieces and nephews... I said, now, you watch your, you take care of your grandpa. You take care of him. You know, now, I'm, I, we have, Margaret and I have to take care of all the guests. Make sure he's taken care of. Oh, yes. Oh, Uncle Doug, we'll take care of grandpa. We'll take care of him. <clears throat> Later that night, when we got home, we're sitting at the table, and I'm giving Dad his medicine and his evening pills and so forth, and we're rehearsing all the wonderful people we met that day and saw that day, and... Dad was thanking us for having such a birthday party for him. And I said, Dad, did you enjoy the pie? He said, what pie? (laughs) I said, Dad, all these people have brought pie to you, your favorite pie. He said, what pie? I said, Dad, I I bought this special brewed coffee, Colombian coffee, not Batangas, but Colombian coffee. And I said, Dad, I had it brewed especially for you because you love your coffee and pie. Was it good? He said, what coffee? I said, Dad, did you get seconds on that food that, you know, that you had Filipino friends? You know, Terry brought this special lumpia that you love. Did you, what lumpia? And what had happened, everybody was enjoying the party, fellowshipping with one another, that we forgot the guest of honor. We forgot this man, this guest of honor. And you and I can do the same thing at Christmas. We should celebrate. We should give gifts. We should use this opportunity to minister to others. But let's make sure we keep Christ, who's the reason for the season, make sure we keep him at the center. Lord Jesus, this Christmas is all about you. All about you. Because you paid the price for Christmas. You paid the price. Father, thank you for this wonderful story of Christmas. We ask now, Lord, that you would use us as we have given thought to some of these events in the glorious history of redemption. Father, would you use us For your namesake, use us for your glory. Oh, God, would you do this, please? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.